This is the Inside Segment, where your questions and comments matter at 202-319-7810. Join the conversation. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on WHUR, WHUT-TV, Sirius XM Channel 141 and 96.3 HD2. This is the Insight Segment. I'm Harold Fisher. These days, when you talk about Washington, D.C., much of the discussion is about the rise in crime, how expensive it is to live here, even the poison politics from Capitol Hill to the mayor's office and the D.C. Council. But there is so much more to D.C., the District of Columbia, a rich and multi-layered history and culture not discussed enough. Well, tonight we give you a taste of that history and culture as we celebrate 202 Day based on the well-known area code of D.C. We begin with Angie Ange, Director of Content for WHUT-TV, also in studio with me, Kojo Namdi, host of the Politics Hour with Kojo Namdi on WAMU-FM. He also hosted this program, The Daily Drum, on WHUR and Evening Exchange on WHUT-TV. And I could read his resume and then we could just end the program. So we're not going to do that. (laughs) We will hear from Kojo in just a bit. But I want to start with Angie. um, 202 Day, what's the genesis of that? This is the second year. This is our second year. And, um, you know, first and foremost, I just want to say it's amazing to be in this in this space with legendary people like That's the That's a way to you. say the old guys. No, yeah. no. Listen, <laughs> the OGs. Yeah, we the all, OG. oh, wow. We were j- literally, I'm listening to Kojo talk about, like, the inception of, of the shows and when things started. He says 1984. And I said, 84? Mm. He says, yeah. I'm like, man, that's when I was born. Oh, but, my. <laughs> oh, wow. So, how, how does that make you feel now, right? Like, you should feel legendary. Oh, my you gracious. You should feel absolutely legendary. No, I'm. It, it's exciting. 202 Day, when I first came back, first and foremost, you know, my career has been built in radio. So after I graduated from Howard in 2006, I had an amazing radio career for the last 15 years. And I went from talent to power. That's that's what I wanted to do. You know, I felt like when you're on air, your job is to execute. And as I learned the radio business, I fell in love with the business of things. I said, you know, I want to move into a place where I can green light things and not always be the one that has to execute what's been green lit. I want to be a part of that that process. I want to be a part of uh, decision making. And so when I left radio and director of content opened up and I was able to come back home to Howard, you know, WHUT is, is where I started. Um, and so having this opportunity to come on as director of content and bring WHUT back to the community because it's such a heritage station. And and the first thing I noticed when I came in as director of content, it's been about a year and some change. If you talk to certain natives, it's evening exchange. They know Channel 32, they know evening exchange, and nothing else since, right? And then if you talk to people who are from here who are around my age, we know PBS Kids, uh, which is about (laughs) zero to eight. And then we're just kind of coming back to PBS because now we're we're moving into our 40s. Right. So now all the things that are going on in the world, you you need other perspective. And so you start to come back to it. Uh, Then I talk to to regular residents uh, who who may not be as familiar with HUT over the years. And it's like, is it HUR? You want HUR, HUT? They don't they don't know. So. So I needed to find a way to reconnect WHUT to its community. And so the first initiative that that I put together was 202 Day. And the idea was we've got to find a way to to reattach WHUT to the people the way Evening Exchange did once upon a time, right? And so I said, look, we have all these amazing creators. TV is not the same. I, I talk about this a lot with my team. There is no more radio, television, film. It's just all content. Mm-hmm. And people are consuming it nonstop. And so we've got now, before a camera used to cost twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000. Now you've got young people who, who, who save up their money. They go shoot uh, better than, than some folks who went to school for it. So we've got, a, we've got all this content. Where are we putting it? Where is it being housed? How is it being distributed? And I felt like WHUT could be a conduit of it. So 202 Day is all about being proud to be D.C. That's what, we, that's what we're about. And it's a whole day. I change up the whole programming. So for a full day from 8 a.m. to midnight, it's all D.C. stories. It's all D.C. creators. And it's just it's a good time. And so 
this year we wanted to go even bigger than last year. We got this huge reception. People loved it. Everybody was 202. They, they're proud because we're proud to be D.C. Um, but when do you get to celebrate it? Because like you said, we're always talking about the bad stuff that's happening, but there's so many rich stories. Who's telling those stories? Where are they being housed? They should be housed at WHUT as far as I'm concerned. So last year was great. We said we're going to do it again this year. And I said, we got we to gotta go big. Kojo Namdi was celebrating 50 years, 50 years uh, uh, in his career and 50 years of impact, 50 years. And I was like, oh, we got to get him back. We got to bring him back. And uh, sure enough, Rock Newman hooked that up. And we said, okay, this is going to be the centerpiece for 202 Day in terms of all the programs that will run. And so 50 years with Kojo Namdi is, is what I'm so excited to, to bring to WHUT. I think there's so many people that's going to turn that TV on and see a familiar face and be so happy to see him and rock. And then after that, throughout the day, it's just all these different stories. You, we've got DMV The Beat, which is a WHUT original. We tell the stories of, of different artists um, of all different backgrounds from nonchalant, but they're from here. You know, nonchalant, DJ Cool, et cetera, et cetera. Then we got uh, DC Street Jocks Rock the House, which we'll talk about some of our other programs, mm -hmm. Berry Farm documentary. So we cover different topics. So there's arts, there's gentrification, there's... Um, you know, how things came to be in D.C. Yeah, history. History. Yeah, the culture, the music, w yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. I, I saw uh, some of that today. And and before we go to, to Kojo, I did want to ask you, what does D.C. mean to you when somebody says, Angie Ange, D.C., not District of Columbia, not <laughs> Washington, D.C., but D.C.? What, yeah. what comes to heart? Oh, the first thing is home. You know, my I got two parents. They listening right now. Actually, my whole family listening. My grandmother listening. Everybody listening. <laughs> uh, because that's what we do when you're from here. Uh, but I have two parents who are from Northwest D.C. My mom went to Coolidge. My dad went to Eastern. Um, you know, they. my mom went to Howard. My dad went to Bowie State. My root is here. My grandmother's house is is up the, well I can't say her address but both my grandparents <laughs> house you know my well, grandmother and cooking and we need to stop by and get a plate well you know <laughs> then my, my aunts will say you shouldn't put the, the, the address out there the street but you know we call out streets and stuff um V Street for my my dad's side of family Madison for my for my mom's side so this is home this has always been home and and I love home and I grew up in Prince George's County, you know, which many will call, you know, the Ninth Ward, right? Mm, yeah, um, oh, boy. We wanted, hey, look, my parents <laughs> wanted grass. They wanted some, my dad said he needed grass. He, he didn't have a backyard like that. Um, but home, culture. You know, I would come to Georgia Avenue um, during Caribbean Fest. I remember that was like one of my favorite things to do, catch the train. I worked in the Department of Justice. You know, I myself went to Howard. So when I think D.C., I don't think about all the so much all the negative, I think about just all the stories and storytelling. And so DC for me is home. Yeah. And I want to push that more. I want to celebrate that more. While we also talk about the issues, because these are these are issues we, we have to always speak to issues, speak truth to power. But we also got to look at the fact that, man, we got some great stories here. Yeah. It's a powerful people that have come from this city that have done things nationally and globally. And we can't forget about that, especially when D.C. is changing so much. Speaking of stories, joining me now is uh, Rock Newman, host of The Rock Newman Show 2.0. And he's going to talk to us about 50 years with Kojo Nambi. Hey, Rock, how are you? My brother, I am great. And I'm sitting here listening to Angie. <laughs> and my love for Washington, D.C. runs deep, deep, deep. So I, I literally, I'm, I'm sitting outside because I wanted to have great reception, and I got chills running up and down my arm. You just did that to me, Angie. <laughs> I love it. And, and Rock, bef <laughs> before you know, I, I have you, you know, share with Kojo. I wanted to ask Kojo the same thing that I asked Angie. What does DC mean to you? Because you know, obviously, you know, you you weren't born here, but some would argue here was born in you. I was well, born in Guyana, South America, but I have been living in Washington, D.C. for about 55 years. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know what D.C. means to me, I can not only tell you, I can show you. Oh, you've got a tattoo. Oh, wow. You've got the D.C. You got a DC tattoo. The D.C. flag <laughs> tattooed yeah. on my forearm because you are right. 
I was not born in D.C., but D.C. was born in me. Mm -hmm. The years that I have spent here have been the most important years of my life. And as Angie was saying, if you are from D.C., you get to understand that this is not Washington, the nation's capital only. Mm -hmm. This is a city of communities and neighborhoods and friends and good people and hardworking people and people who want their freedom and people who want the ability to have a vote in Congress and people who have struggled over all of these decades, maybe even centuries, to achieve this. You get to know these people, you get to love these people, and that's why 202 kind of lives in you mm -hmm. after a while. Yeah. Rock, talk to me about 50 years with Kojo Namdi. That, <laughs> in, in and of itself, you know, he is, obviously he's a person that we know, he's a person that we, we love, but one could again argue that Kojo is D.C., um, is it too much to say he 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 is as big as DC, Rock? I tell you what, not too much to say is that Kojo Nami epitomizes DC, the depth, the breadth, the absolute charisma that he has in his stately, mostly quiet way. He represents two o two. He is. Washington D.C. and I am. I was just man. I, I was so thrilled when we started talking about the possibility of doing something special for his 50th anniversary, because he has been not just an anchor on the television station or on the radio station. He has been an anchor that people look to to hear a very cogent, sensible analysis of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I spoke to Glenn Harris, who actually worked side-by-side -side with Kojo for many years at WHUR. And I was like, Glenn, do you have any particular insight into Kojo and as Glenn would normally do, he used some language that I can't use here on the radio right now. <laughs> yeah, there. Lord knows. That, yeah, that's Glenn. And, and for those of you who aren't familiar, Glenn, Glenn Harris is the uh, former longtime sports director here at WHUR. Glenn was here when I was here back in the late 80s. But go right ahead, Rock. Not yet. And for those of you who don't uh, know, Glenn yeah. Harris and Rock Newman played baseball for Howard University wow. together. That's right. And did play bonded, ball bonded ever since. And to this day, they are still firm friends. Well, go ahead, I, Rock. I, absolutely. So replied to my was, I have like one So that Maryland farmer is an expert in everything. He knows everything. He knows <laughs> He knows everything about everything. And Kojo is, has been just so polished and well-versed on all D.C., good, bad, ugly, crazy, and the rest, and is so utterly respected that would be one of the few people that you might not ever hear a negative comment about. He has been truly a shining star around in all through Washington, D.C. And I was absolutely thrilled, Harold, to have the opportunity to sit and, and talk with him. When you were talking to Rock Kojo, this obviously is about you, but even as a, as, as a, as a person of a certain age... <laughs> In talking about your experience here, did you learn anything about yourself just reflecting on hmm. that? A great deal, as a matter of fact. Um, Rock and I are really competing to see who would interview whom first. Because <laughs> he is as much an icon of D.C. and especially of Howard University as I am. But I'm really glad that Angie talked a bit about her relatives and her parents and grandparents listening to WHUR, because when I came to WHUR in November of 1973, the station was just two years old, mm. and a lot of people who live in Washington, D.C., 
grew up with WHUR. Listening to WHUR has become a family tradition. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it has become a, a terrific impact on my own life because when we started here, we were all young in our 20s. We were all looking to a future in which we would see the benefits of the struggle that had gone before. before. And we were in the fortunate position that we were able to continue to continue documenting that struggle mm -hmm. as we saw it expand across the Caribbean and across Africa and include all of that into our coverage. That's why you have people from Guyana sitting in front of your mic and an engineer <laughs> from Guyana, Bobby Adams, Represent. sitting back there who's been there forever when we first started doing Insight. But it was a very exciting time. And for people like me, it was a formative time. I, I like D.C. because I grew in D.C. as D.C. grew on me. You learn to meet a lot of people who came from all over the world who were participating in this struggle and who, from a cultural standpoint, were interested in what WHUR could contribute to that struggle in any kind of way. You got to know a great many people. And for people who understand the politics of this region and the politics of this city, D.C. is an intriguing place to be involved in observing politics and observing culture. So for me, the last 50 years have been a growth period, and I'm really glad that there are some people who seem to have appreciated that along with me. Yeah. Rock, what did you learn about Kojo as you were putting together this 50 years with Kojo Nambi? How the brother is so graceful and so humble he is the characteristics and the personality of a Kojo Nambi come across as all that you want your son to be you want your son to grow up to be a man like Kojo Nambi he talks about his son he talks about their growth and how he how he grew from being married and having a son and from uh, uh, living on Chapin Street. I, that, now, that's one thing <laughs> I was totally surprised about. Mm -hmm. I gave him the example that I went up to Chapin Street one day dr driving. I got stopped four or five times from 14th Street to 15th Street, people trying to sell me drugs. Mm. I went and, and, and called the chief of police, Chief Jefferson, and said, hey, man, I don't know where all your policemen are, but they need to be on Chapin Street. Kojo grew up there and survived there. And although there was a lot of mess there, Kojo never let the mess get on him. Mm. That's a part of his DC, DC experience. And people just don't have an appreciation or understand how all of the different experiences he has had, has made him such a wise man, such a wise counsel about all things DC. All right. Uh, Rock, I appreciate that. And we are going to continue uh, this conversation in a bit as we give you a preview of 202 Day, a celebration of DC culture, a celebration of DC history, the, the colorful, the multi-textured tapestry mm -hmm. that is DC. Can I get an amen? Come on, that, listen, I thought, I listen, thought, you I did thought that's, it. I, I love I heard, it. You're I heard selling that. it. Yeah, You're that, selling it. We it, need that. It, 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 it's all, it, it, you know, you, hold, uh, Rock, hold on. I, I've got to take a break, but we will come back to you in just a bit. Stay with us. The Daily Drum will continue on Sirius XM Channel 141 and WHUT TV. I'm Harold Fisher. John Mons is next with the original Quiet Storm. That's on WHUR. This conversation continues on WHUT TV and Sirius XM Channel 141 in just a bit. WHUT is dedicating weekdays at 1030 a.m. to bring you the best of our locally produced series, like our arts and artists show, Artico. Our energetic music series, DMV The Beat. Get out. When I wrote that song, we were fighting. And stories highlighting the endurance of the human spirit with legacy. He used to say to me all the time, when, I'm, when I die, the newspaper's yours. So remember, tune in weekdays at 10.30 a.m. 
Howard University Television PBS and WHUR 96.3 are joining forces Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. as we bring you Harold Fisher and the Daily Drum live as we take you inside the stories of the DMV. We've got the experts and the people that matter most to help you make informed decisions for your family and your community. That's the Daily Drum Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. live on WHUT and WHUR. Better together. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on Sirius XM Channel 141 and WHUT-TV. I'm Harold Fisher. Tonight, we are giving you a preview of 202 Day, which is a celebration of the culture of D.C., the history of D.C., the, the people and the events that made it what it is. Mm -hmm. Joining me in studio, uh, Angie Ange, who is the director of content for WHUT TV, uh, Kojo Namdi, who is, among other things, the host of the Politics Hour on WAMU FM. He also hosted this program, The Daily Drum and Evening Exchange on WHUT TV. Also, Rock Newman, host of The Rock Newman Show. 2.0. He's talking to us about 50 years with Kojo Namdi. Lines are open at 202-319-7810, 202-319-7810. Angie, talk to me about putting this 202 day together. Again, as we said in the beginning, this is the, the second year, mm -hmm. but what do you want the message to be for people who are newcomers yeah. to this city? Yeah. I want the message to be that WHUT is telling your stories on your station. That's our tag, right? right. I, want it, I want the message to be that D.C. is a sacred, special place. That it's, it's more than the headlines you see on the news, but that there's a home, there's a place that houses these stories, these magical stories of all these different people, um, these cultural stories of all these different people, these diverse stories, because a lot of times I get asked, we're, you know, diversity, I hear that word all the time, and I say, you know, you do know black people are very diverse, right? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're not all this one type of person, and, um, I wanted to. I want WHUT to be a place, an incubator for local creators, first and foremost, and independent creators, so that we can really grow the creative economy. But you can't do that if people don't understand professionalism, right? If they don't understand how to grow their from art to a professional and what they do. So that's part one for WHUT. And then 202 Day is really just saying, hey, these are our stories. And hey, here's a place that's telling these different stories from people that you may have heard about or seen, but did you ever get to know them? Like, I know the Kojo Namdi name. I know the Kojo Namdi brand. When I sat and l watched Rock and Kojo go back and forth and learn, and I didn't, I never knew he had a tattoo of all things. So right, there I didn't we never go. know he had a tattoo with DC, <laughs> DC flag on it. But that's what makes WHUT so special is that we should be a safe place for our history to be told in depth in a different way yeah. and and we we got to do that for ourselves or else you know there there's there's um in the berry farm documentary the creator of that she spoke to if we don't tell our story they'll, they'll erase it it won't it won't exist if we don't tell it yeah and so you have storytellers but where is the story living and uh, right now you have things like youtube but that's what a heritage station like whut and whur that's what we can do because if you look at media now it's it's usually owned by one one entity right that owns hundreds of stations and it's all controlled in one way. It all there's one workflow. WHUR and WHUT are kind of the last of the of, of the of the independents when it comes to just no one can tell us what we do and don't do. And who and, we are. And who we are. Yeah. And we're we're a PBS we're the only HBCU with a PBS license. So we can we can piggyback off of what PBS is doing, but we can also create 
our own experience for our viewer. But and I'm glad Rock talked about that shape and speech street experience, which is the place I first lived when I came to DC. Yeah. Because a lot of people will look at DC today and say, look, DC got problems. DC got a crime problem. <laughs> DC got a carjacking problem. It does because it's our problem because mm. we are DC. When he talked about Chapin Street, my wife Pamela and I, we have five sons. They were all raised in DC and during the height of the crack cocaine epidemic in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, that was around our street. We lived on S Street in those days and that was happening around our street. And we knew people who were getting killed and we knew people who were killing other people, but it was our community. We knew all of those people. We knew that those problems had to be ours to help to solve. And even today, as we look with some, as you get to my age, some fear at the kind of carjacking that's occurring, you do have to understand that the people who are doing this are coming out of our community, so it becomes our responsibility to do something about this. My partner and I, Tom Sherwood, talk about this mm -hmm. every week on the politics hour because we have a, and he has a tattoo too, by the way, <laughs> of, of the DC, because we understand that in the final analysis, we're not going anyplace. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and we're going to help to try to solve those problems. Yeah. Rock, before I let you go, from your perspective, what what is the DC message? The DC message is the most human of messages. We have trials. We have, fortunately, DC is a place where there are so many examples of the very, very impactful trials. Out of those trials, there have been so many triumphs year after year, decade after decade. You know, Kojo left, i just give a small example. Kojo left doing the Daily Drum. Today, we have Harold Fish doing the Daily Drum. And Harold, it seems like we're being celebrated. Brother, I wanna celebrate you. I wanna take the liberty to celebrate you and all that you have done. You have become a resolute institution in this mm. fabric of what is Washington, D.C., and I want to applaud you for becoming that institution. Rock, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I'm not easily embarrassed, nor do I blush, but oh, I think... you should be, yes, because Rock, but... I was telling him that earlier in my career, I was covering his father. Yes. So you're seeing this wow. passing from one generation to another. That's right. Yeah. Rock Newman, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Congratulations, mm -hmm. On 50 Years with Kojo Namdi, we will be looking at it on 202 Day, which is Friday. Friday. It is this Friday. Yep. So, again, Rock Newman, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I appreciate your time. Love you, Rock. Okay, brother. Love to all. <laughs> Let me go to the phone lines real quick because we do have some, some folks who want to talk to you, Kojo. Sandra calling from Southeast D.C. Thanks for calling, Sandra. What's yes, on your mind? Uh, good evening and Happy New Year to you all. Uh, Angie, um, I really like what, what you are doing, and uh, I wanted to tell Kojo that I was very, very blessed to talk to him on his last show during the political hour with Tom Sherwood. Mm. And also, I wanted to say hello to Rock Newman, because, Rock, I wanted to tell you Happy New Year to let you know that I spoke to Kathy Hughes this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, and Rock, I remember you also because I used to call your show. But anyway, Kojo, I wanted to let you know that the sun is really shining with that yellow uh, <laughs> sweater on. <laughs> and, I, and I also wanted to tell you that I I talked to you also because. I was an identical twin, and I know you have twin yes, sons. Yes. How old are they now, Kojo? Tell they the now, truth. They are now 52 years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, I feel old. <laughs> well, Sandra, thank you so much for, uh, for listening. And uh, sharing. Um, and for mentioning Kathy Hughes, because she's part of both Glenn and my history also. Yes. That's right. So, Sandra, <laughs> thank too. you so she much. My boss. <laughs> we, we appreciate your phone call. Let me talk to Michael calling from Maryland. Michael, thanks for calling. What's on your mind? Yes, thank you for taking my call. Sure. Uh, Kojo, this is a, a name from the past. Michael Friend from Howard. I came to Howard in 77. Uh, brother, you embraced me in the school of C. 
<laughs> and, uh, you know, all these years later, uh, you know, I'm the director of Solar Motion Players. We're celebrating 40 years. But I, I honor you, my brother, because you are truly my mentor, celebrating 50 years, talking about, you know, just how to stick to it, stay committed, do it for the people, grassroots work. And, you know, one, one other name I want to throw in because I was an intern with Ron Sutton. My man was... Uh, he was he was digging deep in sports, and that's yeah. who I, I I was worked under when I was at WHR. But all congratulations to you, Kojo. You you deserve all of it. Michael, congratulations to you. Great to hear from you. I'm glad glad you brought up the name Ron Sutton. Yeah, <laughs> Michael, thank you so much for your phone call. Uh, I want to move to one of our next guests. Joining me now is Beverly Lindsay Johnson. She's a filmmaker, and the the creative process behind a documentary, D.C. Street Jocks. Mm -hmm. I was the music guy, so I would play the records at the point. A music evolution that would change the game. The best jocks in D.C. were these street jocks. They innovated and manipulated new sounds with records, turntables, and mixing. It's an art and a craft. They became legends of Black DC's nightlife. DC's street jobs. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Beverly, thank you for joining the program. Talk to us about this documentary because, you know, for the uninitiated, most of the, and I'm aging or dating myself, when you talk about disc. Jockeys, you know we you know, that you know that's from the old radio days, but these are the people that you heard on the air. But as the name suggests, the DC street jocks, they they were the the sound of the city on the streets. Yes, they absolutely were. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be on the show today. And I have to say one thing: I was Kojo's last producer. Wow. Uh, before he left WHUT. Sure was. <laughs> and so, sure. hi, Coach. Hey, Bev, great to hear you. <laughs> great to hear you, too. But um, D.C. Street Talks rock the house. You know, in the, in the 70s and even in the 60s and 70s into the 80s, D.C. was a dancing town. They were a, a uh, hotbed. D.C. was a hotbed for music. There were clubs, nightclubs, dance clubs all over the place. And street jocks, which are now called DJs, okay, but street jocks, club jocks, they really ruled the entertainment that, you know, was going on in these clubs. I mean, if you were here in D.C. in the 70s and early 80s, you would remember nightclubs called the Mark Four. Oh my! <laughs> Classic, Fox Trap, Tiffany, the Mark the Four. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute! Hold on. <laughs> I think you hit a nerve there, uh -oh. Harold. Wait, 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 the Mark IV was on 12th in New York Avenue. 12th in New York. Okay, so what was the place on Benning Road? Right right uh, across yeah. from the from the, 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 the Pepco power plant. Oh, that's the Chateau. Yeah. Uh, Chateau, the Chateau. Chateau. Oh, the Chateau. <laughs> that's the Moon Man. Yeah, called. that's right. The I've Chateau, never been Chateau. in there, though. I mean, not just... <laughs> I'm like, go ahead, Beverly. <laughs> yeah. but, but he, he lied guys, cleverly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, these guys created a culture. I mean, it, it's something that you don't hear about. You hear about the, the, the street jocks out of New York, the street jocks out of Chicago, even in Baltimore, but you don't hear anything about the jocks here in uh, D.C. And, um, you know, they just ruled. I mean, even they broke records. You know, that um, sometimes the radio stations, you know, they, they would listen to a record. You know, the promoters would come in with a, with a record, they play this, and they wouldn't play it. But then they would go to the street jocks, and the street jocks would play it, like, over and over and over again at a club, and the audience 
would start to like really like it and then they would want to go to the rec you know they would go to the record stores you know at that time you bought records and, and uh, you would go to the record store and ask for a particular song, and they didn't have it, so the record store would have to order it. And then, the uh, as they were playing it, and they were ordering it, and the radio stations would say, "Well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, uh, how did this, you know, get to number whatever on the on on the Billboard charts?" And then they would start to play it, and so the street jocks were credited were breaking quite a number of records. But people were dancing all over the place. And the street jocks, they just entertained. They kept the dance floor moving. Um, you know, it was just great jocks such as Maniac McCloud and DJ Eardrum and Sam the Man Burns and Smitty the Mighty Blazer. Mm. <laughs> oh, see, and see, I think one of the things, Beverly... As I'm beginning to uh, get a little warm now, yeah. because I'm starting to, I, I mean, you, you just talk, because here's here's the thing, and I think Kojo kind of talked about this. And you this. did go to the Chateau, you know. I, yeah. <laughs> I think I was in there what looking, was looking, in looking the for my grandfather. I don't know. What was but, I mean, but you, the, the thing about it, the, and you talk about the D.C. scene, and not just the D.C. proper, but, uh, I mean, who can who can forget the advertisement for the Black Crystal, <laughs> you know, or, or you know, L.A. Cafe, yeah. or you know, the, obviously, you know, the the classics and Ibex right there on exactly. on Georgia oh, Avenue. Ibex, now see, now you're getting into my. Yeah, I know, about the I know that's right. You know, <laughs> and. Because, and, and Beverly, talk to me about this, because I think it, it wasn't just so much the music, but how these DJs related to the people that they mm -hmm. were playing for. Well, they, these guys had not only an ear, but, you know, just a mind for playing music. And they knew how to test an audience. You know, they, they, they just knew it. They just had it in their soul how to play. And that's what they did. And that's exactly what they did. And then, like I, you know, like I said, I, they, they kept the place jumping. Um, I, have a, I have a little scene in the, um, the documentary with Candy Shannon. Mm. Now, Candy Shannon was a radio announcer, but... Uh, Channel 9, WUSA, back in the day, they decided, like, to go up against uh, Video Soul. And they had a video, um, the mu video music connection. And Candy Shannon hosted it. And she would go around to the different um, uh, clubs and feature the, the DJs. And, and so we have, you know, a spot for her. Um, because she helped to promote the DJs as well, yeah. the street jocks. Yeah, I, I I love Candy, and I and you and you start talking about you know it, I think way back when it wasn't even WUSA, it was WTOP TV. Correct. Wow. You know, way, yeah, I know. That's and, oh, that's know, in the way back machine with Peabody and Sherman. Look, when I'm watching, <laughs> when I first watched DC Street Jocks Rock the House, right, Candy Shannon was my professor at yeah. Howard at one point. So, and she's still on um, the radio. Yeah, and, and had one of the most, she still does, has one of the most amazing radio voices. So Absolutely. I always admired that. And so when I saw that clip of her in the nightclub, I'm like, look at Candy Shannon, yeah. that was amazing. And and I will say, just mark your calendar, on Friday, uh, DC Street Jocks Rock the House runs at 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. And again, when I was watching it, because as, as Beverly said, nightlife culture is is huge in dc it continues to be that general from generation to generation so for me watching it i was just like wow dc was was popping in this in this era absolutely and just to see the like she said it's the contribution the musical contribution that these djs had that helped propel major records nationally and globally that comes from here and and that's beverly saying we have to tell that story and again, that's part of what 202 Day is about. Beverly is not only talking the talk, she's walking the walk because both she and her husband are also DJs. <laughs> oh, yeah. now see, now see that's, not in the, that's not in the film, Beverly. 
Oh, I got to tell yeah. it, though. <laughs> well, look, Beverly. Oh, let the out. <laughs> Beverly, thank you for spending a little time with us and just giving us, again, a taste of the, the music and the culture of D.C. We also really look forward to checking out your documentary on 202 oh, Day on Friday. Do. Yes. It's Thank fun. Thank you so much. Thank you so very, very much. Okay. Uh, Bye-bye. Coach, before we, we move forward, I, I do want to ask you to briefly, you know, talk to us about the evolution of WHUT TV because, again, you you came here two years after WHUR started in 1973, WHUR started, of course, in 1971, mm-hmm. but it was WHMM and then you know WHUT. So, talk to us about your your time there and how how things evolved. You know, one of the interesting things was that WHUR was and is a commercial broadcasting station. Mm-hmm. WHMM, it was that then called. Uh, it meant Howard Mass Media, HMM, Howard Mass Media, was a part of the public broadcasting system. And so it did not have commercials. And as a result, from the very beginning, the station had to struggle in order to present programs and find an audience, but was determined to do that. And so from the very first launch, and I remember when they had like their first year anniversary, Bill Cosby was the host of the first year anniversary. When they had their first year anniversary, they said, what kind of programming can we do that can attract viewers in this area? And that's when Evening Exchange was born. When it first started, Mm -hmm. it was hosted by a former WHUR announcer called Jerry Phillips. And Mm -hmm. Jerry Phillips and uh, a woman who was later on television, whose name I'm blanking on, first began hosting Evening Exchange, and it was a nightly live broadcast, not unlike this broadcast, that took telephone calls. It was amusing in those days, because when I inherited that position of hosting that show, you still had to take phone calls, and the host himself took the phone calls by reaching backwards over your shoulder (laughs) and pressing a button. And pressing the button, yes. And said, caller, are you there? And we didn't have a significant time delay in those days, so there were occasionally crank callers from time to time. But what (laughs) gave the show vibrancy was the fact that it was new, Mm. it was live, viewers and listeners in D.C. had the opportunity to join conversations about events taking place in this area and all over the world, and people got the opportunity to find out just how well informed people who live in D.C. are about these issues and Mm -hmm. how opinionated they are. So it was groundbreaking in many ways and attracted an audience, even though in those days, WHMM was not able to get a whole lot of programming that people craved, but it evolved into WHUT, which was Howard University, or is Howard University Television. That's where we find ourselves appearing today, and is still a bedrock in this community. Absolutely. I want to go to Gregory calling from Sacramento, California. Gregory, quickly, what's on your mind? Uh, Good evening. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I just wanted to say that as a native of D.C., born and raised, I remember Kojo back in the day as I was a younger man, um, very young man, we all I remember <laughs> the stories that were told on HUR, like the uh, hostage takeover in 77. Um, I remember growing up listening to Carl T. Rowan. Mm. And as I became a little bit more mature, uh, Melvin Lindsay came on the scene and HUR just exploded. And Coach, I just want to say I praise you and I appreciate you and continued success. Thank you very much because you can't really talk about WHUR without talking about Melvin Lindsay and the Quiet Storm. Mm. That programming was created by Kathy Hughes and it it is what caused WHUR to to go into the stratosphere, so to speak, to rise very rapidly in the ratings and become a station that was just not listened to by a number of devoted usually African-American listeners, but a station that was listened to not only around this region, but eventually around the nation and that format around the world. So thank you for bringing up Melvin Lindsay and the Quiet Storm. Thank you so much, Gregory, for your phone call. I want to go now to filmmaker and cultural anthropologist Sabia Prince. She tells us about the history and the culture 
of the Barry Farm community in her film, Barry Farm. First time that I heard about Barry Farm was actually from my grandfather. He loved to tell me about DC history and he would say, you know, this used to be this and that used to be that. And I was like, really grandpa? Because I don't see it. <laughs> you know, he's telling me about Barry Farm and I didn't understand what he was saying. I still didn't fully understand the successive levels of people living on that site and how you could have a place where freedmen used to live and a public housing project and, you know, civil rights activists and go-go music. Like, it was, it was a lot. And it made me think about telling the story and getting the story on record. If you're not on record, it's almost like you didn't exist. Sabia, thank you so much for joining the program. I'm going to say I watched the entire documentary today. I'm not going to give it away, but holy cow. Well done. Sabia, wow. are you there? Congratulations. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it, it was fantastic. Yep. Really, really, it, it, it was amazing. I learned so much. Why did you decide to, to step into this very complex story? Well, thank you so much, and I have to share those accolades first and foremost with my co-director, Samuel George, of the Bergelsman Foundation, and the whole project was supported by Empower DC and the DC Legacy Project, uh, which is an organization that Carissa Naruzzi gave birth to over there with all of her hard work and her staff. That is our beautiful history in Washington, DC, a history of resistance, a history of perseverance, a, a history of struggle, uh, of memory, and growing up here as a Native, I didn't get to learn my local history. I mean, we got it from our parents and our grandparents, but we didn't get it in the schools, and so it's been a journey for me to learn the many, many bits and pieces of our history, not only in Berry Farm, but across the whole city, so it was a deep honor for me to be in a position to uplift that history and share it with others and um, also emphasizing that it is a living history. There are people that are alive today, right, that live there, that were displaced from there, and who are trying to get back there. So um, I was very happy and excited to be a part of those efforts. What did you learn that you didn't know before, the thing that struck you the most? Well, I'm going to keep it very real. Being a native, we talked about Bamas, we talked about <laughs> neighborhoods. That's right. And we talked about neighborhoods that were, quote, unsafe and or bad. And so I had to unlearn that. I had to unlearn that classism um, mm. and the history of working class people and how working class people, which I'm descendant from, hold this city up. Uh, and that all of these neighborhoods across the city have very rich histories that, in the case of Berry Farm, actually goes all the way back to the Reconstruction period. Yeah, I did to, not to know that. It was not that. named for the mayor for life. Yes, correct. Right. It was <laughs> not. It was not. <laughs> yeah, how about it that? It was not. <laughs> mm. um, you know, and that's the process of learning over time. By the time I got to making the film, of course, I had absorbed that history and I was ready to share it with others. You know, one of the things that I think people need to be reminded, you know, because growing up in this area, we always called it Berry Farms yes. Yes. with an yes. S, yes. but it, it's Berry Farm. Farm. Correct. No, that's what I learned watching this. Right. And I said, Sabia, Sabia and Sam did such a great job with this because the Berry Farms I know, <laughs> I never knew that the backstory of it until I watched it, and it's such an amazing, such an amazing program, and I, I'm that's why we had to make that a part of two o two day. Yeah, it was an absolute must. Job well done to Sabia. That's going to be eight a.m. by the way, eight a.m. and nine p.m. Um, they kick off two o two day and help us wrap it up on Friday as well. Yeah, I, I, the the cinematography is is fantastic the animation is was surprising to me i wasn't expecting to see that and i just thought mm -hmm. it was it really told a great story and it and it's a very very as documentaries are supposed to be emotional 
It was a very, very uh, emotional piece, and there were some things in there that I do remember. But I, I want to thank you so much, Sabia Prince, for, for sharing in this preview for us, and congratulations on the documentary. I'm sure there's going to be uh, much more ahead for you. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Uh, I, I only have a few uh, minutes left, but I, I did want to get a final comment uh, from you, Angie, when you look at what what this 202 day this year means for you personally, because this is, um, it's an achievement. Thank you. It, it's an achievement. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it means we're moving forward. We're moving forward and we're progressing. And again, my main goal as the director of content for WHUT is to give it back to the people. You got to give this station back to the people. It has too much history, too much heritage, too much culture for us not to give it back to the people. And the way that we will do that is in telling our stories. Yeah. And that, that is what I hope you get. WHUT.org has all the, it has the lineup. If you want to watch the trailers, if you want to just be informed about it, WHUT.org, we've got the whole, every, all information goes there. And Kojo, uh, 30 seconds, your, your thoughts about your entire life in, in 30 seconds and, <laughs> and, and, and your achievements and, and what this 202 day will mean for you. I'm happy that I continue to be in broadcasting today. That could not have happened without the existence of WHUR and WHUT. So I am proud that both of those institutions are continuing the community work that they do. And I am happy to be able to try to continue the community work that I have been blessed to do for these past 50 years. And to thank you, Harold Fisher, for having me on this broadcast because Insight is a particular favorite of mine, having created the segment myself. <laughs> I, I want to thank all of our guests. <laughs> <laughs> All of our guests awesome. um, who were on the program, and of course, Kojo and Angie, thank you so much thank for coming you. in. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. And finally tonight, some thoughts on D.C. You know, I was born here, Eli Place, right off of Minnesota Avenue. My dad grew up on Bass Place Southeast. My mother, 48th Place Northeast, near the shrimp boat. But... I was raised in Prince George's County. Now, from the football team to Mayor Marion Barry to Go-Go and all the multi-textured history and culture, I will always call D.C. home. There's so much negative noise about D.C. Sometimes it's hard to block it all out. But there is still so much more to take in that will enrich and edify you if you just take a moment to explore. You'll be better for it. That's The Daily Drum for this Wednesday, January 31st, 2024. I'm Harold Fisher. Good night. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.